Amanda is going to speak about optimal cord clamping. And Amanda's been a midwife for 30 years. And this is like her passion um, to persuade all of us not to rush with uh, clamping the cord. Um, she comes from England. Um, I don't think we've actually ever met, but we know each other through social media. And I'm just going to let Amanda say anything more she wishes to say about herself. Over to you, Amanda. Hi. Uh, well, I'll say good evening, everybody. I know that we're all in different time zones, so I'll say hello and welcome. Um, I'm going to talk about optimal cord clamping. I do speak quite fast, so hold on to your seat, because it, everybody thinks it's a very small subject to talk about, but it's actually not. It's very comprehensive, and I do try and cover everything. If I don't cover everything or there's any questions, you can get back to me afterwards, and I will follow along to your questions via social media. So we'll talk about optimal cord clamping. Who, whose blood is it anyway? And hopefully by the end of this presentation, there will be no doubt. So it's not a new thing. Um, Aristotle spoke about optimal cord clamping in 300 BC, and he said frequently the child appears to be born dead or is feeble, but before tying the cord, a flux of blood occurs into the cord and adjacent parts. Some nurses squeeze the blood back out into the core of the cord into the baby's body, and at once the baby, who has previously been drained of blood, comes to life again. Rosmus Darwin, in 1796, said the same thing, that another thing very injurious to the child is the tying and the cutting of the navel string too soon, which should always be left until the child has not only repeatedly breathed, but until all pulsation in the cord ceases. Otherwise, the child is much weaker than it ought to have been, a part of blood being left in the placenta, which ought to have been in the child. And at the same time, the placenta does not so naturally collapse and withdraw itself from the sides of the uterus and is not for, removed with so much safety and certainty. So where did immediate cord clamping came in? It came in about 50 or 60 years ago when the advent of oxytocin drugs were introduced for the, to reduce postpartum hemorrhage, which of course they did, but part of the active management was immediate cord clamping, which became routine practice. And at the time when it came in routine practice, there was no thought given to the effect of, the, uh, effect of immediate cord clamping on the fetus, even though it was documented and we knew, we knew that... Um, baby lost 30% of the blood volume. And there isn't any, any evidence to support immediate core clamping. There hasn't been then, and there certainly isn't any more now either. Can everybody hear me? I think we've got a few signs saying that it's a bit muffled. I talk about a story. My story is I have two boys, who you can see on these motorbikes, Sam and Max. Sam and Max are, uh, they both have ADHD, which I'm not saying for one minute that it be becomes that uh, immediate core clamping causes ADHD because it runs in the family. And some people have asked me when I was diagnosed, and when I say that I wasn't, they're all quite surprised. But they've been dealing with schools. It, it took me into contact with teachers who were looking after children with special needs. And they began asking questions. They were saying to me that we had lots of children with medical needs, behavioral needs, um, and learning problems, particularly in boys, and they wondered where it was coming from. I also worked with six job shares and we had 14 children between us. We had five girls and nine boys and seven of the boys had learning problems and only one could be um, diagnosed with a um, chromosomal problem. So it made me start looking at different things about whether, with no randomised control trials, but certainly was there any common denominator that we had, which was, was a, were we have any smokers, any drinkers? And it, anybody had too much sugar? Was it caffeine? Was it the hibiscus or the disinfectants we were using in theatre? And I kept looking at things until one night I had um, a light bulb moment. We are reflexive practitioners and we're supposed to do evidence-based practice. I'd been a midwife for 16 years and I, re I reflected on my practice and realised that immediate cold clumping, which is what we were all taught to do in those days, and certainly I've had my hands slapped for not getting the clumps on quick enough, was um, not evidence-based. So I began to research to see if there was any evidence on the internet to do with this, and I came across this guy called George Morley, who isn't a guy, he's an obstetrician from America, who did a very substantial piece of work where he was absolutely convinced that immediate cord clumping injured the baby's brain and caused the blaze in autism. His, his article is really worth reading, and he said that immediate cord clumping causes cerebral palsy, learning disorders and mental deficiency, respiratory disease syndrome, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. And the experiments that he did actually 
on monkeys with immediate core clamping quite often killed the monkeys or caused irreversible brain damage. I realised at that time, and I thought, because we were supposed to do evidence-based practice as midwives, that it would be really easy to change practice, and I was incredibly wrong. The anaesthetist who told me that I might be right, but it was a very big subject, and to actually say that we were doing something wrong quite, could be quite dangerous and be quiet. I spoke to a midwifery manager who'd always practiced delayed core clamping. I uh, informed a consultant obstetrician who avoided me. But there was a paediatrician who had a sit down chat with me and said that to change practice, I had to gather evidence to say that what I was saying was right. I said to him, on the contrary, what we're doing is actually not backed by evidence, and we should really stop what we're doing because we're depriving the baby of 30% of blood volume without knowing the short term and the long term effects. But it wasn't quite as easy as that. In 2010, I started, well, I started campaigning in 2005, and in 2010, I was asked to be quiet because I went into community and my, my, the, telling the parents informed choice, they were coming into the hospitals and they were asking for delayed core clamping. And I was actually asked to be quiet about it. But in response to us being asked to be quiet about it, I set up a Facebook page, which is Optimal Core Clamping, um, Wait for White. I uh, had a big article in the paper and I set up a petition against NICE, who were very reluctant to change the guidelines for four years. The guidelines at the time actually recommended immediate core clamping, even though there was no evidence. But NICE said the guidelines, which is the English guidelines, because all women should get informed choice. And of course, they don't get informed choice because they're not told to talk about it. They rely on us to do the best for their babies. This photograph, it took about four years to get 6,000 people to follow the page. And this page, which shows a complete circuit, because quite, there's quite um, a lot of people don't understand the physiology that the placenta and the baby are one part and the mother is another part, and the, the placenta and the baby are circulation. And this picture shows it beautifully, and our likers rose from 6,000 to 24,000 practically overnight. We've gone to the evidence, and this placenta is for a baby that was 10 pounds. But you can see by the amount of blood that in the, in the cord that the baby obviously had immediate core clumping, and the baby should have been a lot bigger than 10 pounds. But about changing practice, who wants to change versus who wants change versus who wants to change. And even though we're supposed to have evidence-based practice and the evidence is there and we've got substantial amounts of evidence to support this. And also to remember any clamping and cutting of the cord before it stops pulsating is an actual intervention. And all interventions should be discussed with the parents and consent should be obtained. And we don't do this. So it has been a really interesting journey over the past um, 13 years. But we're getting there slowly, and we need to do this because we don't know the accumulative effects of immediate core clamping. The baby loses 30% of the blood volume. They also lose a substantial amount of stem cells, and we're into second generation core clamping now. And we don't know what effect that's having on the, the, the population as a whole. Diane Farrer and her team are, were a team in Bradford, which is near my hometown, and they did weighing babies to assess placental function in 2010. This diagram shows that this baby was born at 3.4 kgs, and after two or five minutes, the baby was four and a half minutes, the baby had gained 200 grams, which is blood that actually should be in the baby. It's not extra blood, it's the natural circulation and when the job is finished. We talk about the known benefits of delay core clamping and optimal core clamping. I actually don't mind whether it's called delay core clamping or optimal core clamping, as long as immediate core clamping is stopped because it's dangerous. So delayed core clamping is associated with increased neonatal iron stores in the neonatal period, increased organ perfusion and subsequent cardiopulmonary adjustment, increased duration of early breastfeeding, decreased risk of fetal maternal transfusion, decreased umbilical infections because the cord is thin rather than being padded out with old blood, increased white cells and infection, infection prevention, Less blood splatter with HIV protection, because if you've got a fat cord and you cut through the cord, there's blood splatter, which so it protects caregivers. And we know that it benefits neural developmental outcomes, particularly in males. We have that evidence now. White cell infection prevention also was important now. We heard in Africa, because they all said that they did delay cord clamping for three minutes because the increased white cells prevented um, malaria. I've never seen the evidence for that, but it's not rocket science and it would make sense. I talk about Judith Mercer, who is a midwife in America, and she is my heroine. She realized very early on in the late 1990s, 2000, 
the immediate core clumping wasn't evidence-based and needed to be tracked, this needs to be changed. And as a midwife, she knew that in a medical model in America that she needed to um, progress up the academic routes to change practice. And she's now a professor emer emeritus and she is a midwife and she has done a phenomenal amount. She's one of the women that have really, really changed practice throughout the world. And I had the pleasure of meeting Judith on a couple of occasions and she stayed with us last year after a conference in the UK. And we were all very excited about her staying at our house. And uh, my son said, what's the excitement? And I said, it's like having the lead singer of Metallica sleeping in your, be in your spare bedroom. And she's beautiful. She's a really humble woman. And she said that midwifery is the most important job in the world. She's done a lot of information on de delayed cold clumping for premature babies and shows that it decreases the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, late onset sepsis, need for blood transfusions for low blood pressure or anemia, and need for mechanical ventilation, increases hematocrit, hemoglobin, blood pressure, cerebral oxygenation, and red blood flow, cell flow, and also breastfeeding duration, because babies are in more optimal condition. Ola Randerson's a paediatrician from um, Sweden, and he did a randomized control trial in 2011, and showed in 382 full-term infants that delayed core clamping resulted in a reduction of iron deficiency anemia with improved ferritin levels at four months of age. There was no increase in phototherapy or respiratory symptoms, and it showed that iron deficiency, even without anemia, has been associated with impaired development among infants. In 2015, he looked at 263 children from the initial study, and it showed that boys in the delayed core cramping group had decreased fine motor and social skills, um, which shows that boys, which is what I said right at the beginning, are affected more by timing. The timing of core clamping may affect neurodevelopment in children born in a high income country. So that changed in guidelines throughout the world. In 2005, when I realised this, um, that we weren't doing evidence based practice, the World Health Organisation recommended immediate core clamping, but they've changed their guidance to recommend delayed core clamping should be performed during provision of essential neonatal care and particularly important in countries of endemic anemia. There, they, had, um, they started something last year called the First Embrace that recommends that cords should be cut after the cord has stopped pulsating um, in all babies, particularly in underdeveloped countries. Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists in the UK changed their guidance in 2009 to say the cord should be not clamped earlier than is necessary based on a clinical assessment. And more importantly, with, along with that, is that the timing of clamping and cutting the cord should be documented so that we have some retrospective, we can do retrospective studies. Royal College of Midwives, which is in the UK in 2012, recommended that women midwives should be competent in both active management and physiological management. And when women are offered physiological third stage in low risk women, as a reasonable option, many will choose it because normally we don't, quite often we don't give women that, we always do active management. But if somebody's got a low risk pregnancy, low risk labor, and the baby's a normal delivery, why do we always go for active management? Um, because it does have side effects. Nice guidelines in 2014, I say hallelujah because it was a struggle to get them to change. They do not clamp the cord earlier than one minute from the birth of the baby unless the cord or the baby has a heartbeat below 60 birds at beats a minute that's not getting faster, which is a very rare, very rare case. And they say that the cord should be left to pulsate between one and five minutes. Many hospitals just do the one minute. Um, and again, we need to be giving parents this information so that they can make the decisions. We've got a new campaign called Wait for White because we think that in all babies that are uncomplicated, they, they should have a natural transition. So the baby's delivered and the cord goes through the process of shutting down on its own so that the baby has a gentle transition to the outside and they get the blood that they, they require from the placenta. This is a diagram. Another baby with a nice white cord, the cord's empty there, you can see that the baby's got the full transmission and it's lovely and pink, and they're very calm with these babies as well. They don't have to struggle. If the cord's clamped and cut, the baby has to take a deep in breath of, uh, intake of breath, and it upsets the whole transition. Golden hour after delivery, we say the best start in life, it's an hour that this baby will never get back. Safe environment, we say warmth, privacy, dignity, respect, quiet and undisturbed and you have slow, gentle, and peaceful. That results in raised oxytocin, decreased adrenaline, and therefore, quite often, a less problematic third stage. 
Baby gets optimal cold clamping and we wait for white, immediate skin to skin and breastfeeding and time alone to bond with the parents. Picture of a baby there, what's the rush? So if there's no rhesus, no bleeding, there's no rush. We just think that we have to dive in there and separate the placenta from the baby, when actually in the majority of cases there's no rush whatsoever. <clears throat> Talk again about informed choice involving the parents in making the decisions, and it's a, it's, a, it's a given that the parents should be involved. Physiological third stage could be considered as default management in the absence of pregnancy complications. Delayed core clamping is part of active or physiological management because some people think that if you have active management, you can't have delayed core clamping. You can, and in my practice, I tend to do delayed active management. So when the baby's born, I check the baby, make sure the baby's absolutely fine. The majority, in nearly all cases, there's no bleeding because if the placenta's attached, the bleeding only happens when the placenta comes, the placenta only comes apart away and the bleeding starts then. Um, we say neonatal resuscitation with the umbilical cord intact wherever possible, and I do go on to discuss that. For active management, we know that oxytocin following the delivery of the baby. NICE in the UK recommend immediate, in fact, they recommend with the anterior shoulder, which really, if we think about giving the oxytocin with the anterior shoulder, we've actually made a decision to shut that placenta down before the baby's even born, which is a bit bonkers, really. Um, many midwives delay administration, and we call it delayed active management. NICE say allow call to pull, say, unclamp for one to five minutes or longer if the parents request. And this is really important. If parents request it, we, we, we support them in that. Because some hospitals are saying that because NICE say one to five, that that's the, the given. Do control of cord traction. In 2010, Cochrane Review showed that timing of oxytocin made no significant difference to the risk of PPH. So we don't have to, we don't have to rush. And the New Zealand guidance said that there's no oxytocin before clamping. Because very rightly so, we don't have the evidence, we don't actually have the evidence to say that the, uh, giving the oxytocin before the cold stop pulsating or before clamping is a and can cause a problem. So are we falling into the same mistake of doing something without the evidence, which is what we did with immediate core clamping? It is very important to assess and manage the risk of PPH, because if you've got somebody that is higher risk of PPH, postpartum hemorrhage, of course we give the oxytocin sooner rather than later. Um, one birth centre found that they, were, they had increased rates of PPH, but women were, be given, they were all being given for, um, physiological third stage rather than assessing, it, assessing the woman in a holistic manner. When they did the re-education, they got their, their PPH rates down to less than the average. Physiological third stage, we know is no oxytocin, no clamping and cutting, and hands off completely. Because I've seen this where there's physiological and people pulling, and that's what can cause the postpartum hemorrhage. As I said before, if the cord is pulsating, the placenta is still functioning. In the UK, if a postpartum hemorrhage or a delay of an hour, of more than an hour, administer the oxytocin and clamp and cut the cord. Show this, it's the same cord of a baby, and the mum actually had, um, her second baby, had a nuchal cord which was cut, and then a difficulty delivering the shoulders, and that child is actually autistic, and she did this to show the difference between the transition from, in the same cord. Waiting for bite, we've got some pictures to show babies waiting, so presentations are very boring if they haven't got any pictures. And cord clamping the evidence, you can see here with two twins. It looks like a twin to twin transfusion, but it's not twin to twin transfusion. And you can see very, very clearly which baby has had immediate cord clamping and which one hasn't. So South African optim optimal cord clamping, because the UK imported, well, they exported bad practice to all the colonies. And South Africa and lots of other places are doing immediate core clamping. There's a big bunch of midwives down there that are working very, very hard on birth workers to turn this. And quite often we see pictures on social media where the baby's actually been delivered with the cord intact. And this baby looks lovely and pink and has got its um, placenta attached. I went to Tunisia. I had the pleasure of going to Tunisia in February where they asked and they invited me to go over and speak. And they're trying to bring optimal core clamping into their hospitals. And this is a friend, Saida Freyu, who works very, very hard to change practice in Tunisia. And when I visited Tunisia, they had a car park full of men who were still outside the hospital who don't go into the delivery rooms with their, their wives. 
um, and a lot of the, the women that you know the practice is is very different to what we do in the UK. Fabulous set of midwives. Lotus birth is something that's not my speciality, but Sarah Buckley in Australia writes about lotus birth, where the placenta is actually left attached to the baby until it shrivels up and drops off. There's lots of information out there if people want to have a look at it. Nuchal cord cutting. The nuchal cord should never, ever be cut before the baby's delivered. And you can see why with this baby. I mean, it's a little bit prem. But if there's a problem with those shoulders, that baby is in really deep doo-doo. And um, usually, well, not usually, baby will deliver through a, a, a nuchal cord. So we say with a nuchal cord, and the same with uh, shoulder dystocia. If the cord tightens around the neck, the soft-walled vein, more easily compressed, Blood backs up in the placenta and the baby gets hypoxic as well as hypovolemic. Same with shoulder dystocia. If you have a baby that's stuck in the vagina, the blood is backing up in the placenta and babies are delivered in their wives. Quite often the baby has immediate core clamping to be rushed to the recessive tear. The baby's white because more than 30% of the blood volume is actually in the placenta, so that baby is hypoxic as well as hypovolemia. Nuchal cord literature review, it shows that evidence that cutting the, the nuchal cord before the birth does cause harm. It causes a birth rate reduction, hypovolemia, hypertension and shock, anemia, hypoxic encephalopathy, cerebral palsy, and neurodevelopmental delay. Nuchal cord and shoulder dystocia occurs in 1.7 of all births. Case review of nine births showed that nuchal cord was cut before the birth of the shoulders. Three to seven minutes before the shoulders were born, all babies had low APGARs and signs of HIE, several with cerebral palsy, and the authors recommend no cutting of the nuchal cord before birth as a method of to protect the baby, uh, baby's health and provide the, prevent, protect the provider from medical legal action. Show a picture of the somersault manoeuvre, which really this diagram should be turned on its end because we will get a lot better results with gravity, where the baby will actually deliver with it through the cord. Another reason people use to do immediate cord clamping is that the baby needs we need blood gases or Kleihauer. And in the UK, some hospitals have started blood gases from all babies, including physiological third stages, and demanding that the cords cut immediately to do this, which is absolutely bonkers. Um, babies come out and they're in good condition, but depriving the baby of 30% will uh, definitely have a bad effect on the baby's condition. And cord blood samples can still be taken from a pulsating cord. There is no need to clamp and cut whatsoever. Um, after taking the samples, you apply gentle but firm pressure to the needle's entry site, as you would if you were taking venous blood from an adult. We certainly would put gentle pressure on a blood, uh, taking blood from an adult. We do the same with the cord. Talk about a hospital in Newcastle. Um, because they went to um, a conference that run by David Hutchin, who is an a retired obstetrician in the north of England. And he has been campaigning for delay core clamping for a long time. And he's like the king of delay core clamping. He's done lots and lots of work. They went to one of his conferences and there was a midwife, an obstetrician, and a neonatologist. And they came back and they changed practices overnight in 2009. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, they got back and they implemented delay core clamping in all their babies. George, who was the um, advanced neonatal nurse practitioner and midwife, took home 1,973 notes and did a retrospective study which showed that their delaying core clamping in the hospital reduced uh, babies going to the recessive tear from 15% to 4.08%, and their admissions to SCABU neonatal unit were 4.5 reduced to 2.5. Talk about jaundice, because that's one of the, of the obstacles as well, that people say that babies get too much jaundice if they get this blood. And this isn't true. Eight studies showing, um, involving over 1,000 neonates, there was no significant difference in risk of jaundice between 24 to 48 hours. And the most recent meta-analysis of 18, 000, well, 1,828 infants in five studies, there were no significant differences in the clinical jaundice. Cesarean sections as well. Lots and lots of doctors now are doing delayed core clamping and gentle cesarean sections. There has been resistance, but I found on the whole most doctors are very receptive to changing practice because the evidence is there. 
first section was a gentle section. This is not such a gentle section. You can see that this baby is a little bit prem, looks completely stunned, and looks like it could have done with a minute or two to come round and have that transition, and it's losing all that blood that's in the placenta. Talk about gentle sections, so you've got delayed cord clamping or milking of the cord, which I'll talk about in a minute. A warm towel, bedside resuscitation, which I'll also talk about, and waiting to clamp the cord, the umbilical cord, for 30 seconds after an elective section results in higher iron stores at four months of age compared with early cord clamping after vaginal birth and seems to ensure iron status comparable with those achieved after 180 seconds delayed cord clamping after vaginal birth which makes me wonder that if the baby's coming through the vagina, whether the blood that's squeezed as the baby's going through the vagina backs up in the placenta, but that, of course, doesn't happen in the elective cesarean section. Talked about cord milking, which cord milking or cord stripping um, two to four times gave the same benefits as delayed cord clamping. So if anybody's in a rush and the baby's delivered, holding the, holding the cord, and stripping the blood through to the baby and then releasing, let the cord fill up again and doing the same two to four times had the same benefits as delay cord clamping, but of course it's a lot quicker. No harm with milking, there's no increase in jaundice or polycythemia, and placental transfusion should be considered at every delivery as it can have a marked impact on the outcome of newborns. Anup Kathera in San Diego has done extensive research into cord milking, so if anybody wants to have a look at that, he's the, he's the guy to look at. Talk about neurological development with delayed cord clamping. And reflux an animal and human studies suggest that early cord clamping before the onset of certain respirations appears to adversely affect cerebral perfusion during fetal to neonatal transition. Judith Mercer again has demonstrated improved motor function at 18 to 22 months corrected age with delayed cord clamping combined with one time umbilical cord milking compared with immediate cord clamping. Ike Raby in the UK as well has demonstrated similar outcomes with umbilical cord milking compared with delayed cord clamping at 2 and 3.5 years of age. And Ulrich Anderson, we've already discussed his, his, his results. We talk about low sections where the baby can be delivered with a section, which is really easy to do. Resuscitation is really important. The first minute of baby being born, we do 30 seconds of setting and 30 seconds of rescue breath, and this can all be done with the cord intact. Baby that has a cord intact is far likely to be resuscitated more successfully if it's got that blood volume. We say to the ambulance people, if you had a road traffic accident of somebody that had needed resuscitation but no blood loss, compared to a road traffic accident where somebody needed resuscitation but they'd lost 30% of their blood volume, who would you be more successful? At the moment, we clamp, and then we look at the breathing and the airway. It should be the other way around. We should look at the airway, breathing, and then clamp. Resuscitation guidelines are looking at that, and they're actually recommending in their training that we, we try and keep the cord intact for the first 60 seconds. As I said, dry baby, assess for 30 seconds, and then five, five inflation breaths. Obviously, resuscitation is really, really important, and for that reason that we, we actually um, developed a resource trolley called the Life Start Trolley, and I'll just flick onto that because we're running out of time. And it's called the Bedside Assessment, Stabilisation and Initial Cardiorespiratory Support System Trolley. Um, it was a group of consultants and myself, and we realised that the babies that benefited more from delayed cord clamping were the premature babies and the, optim and the compromised babies. But they, at the moment, the babies that are more likely to get immediate cord clamp, and we realise that this has to stop because the, the, the benefits are widely researched and immediate cord clamping on these babies does cause harm. This is the Life Start Trolley, and it can be used in forceps deliveries and cesarean sections, and it's very easy to use and give that, can give that baby a few minutes extra good start. Did a case study. There was a case study where one twin was born and it was completely normal. Everything was fine. The second baby had a cardiac malformation and the baby was resuscitated with the cord intact. Mum and dad held the baby whilst the baby was whilst the baby was being resuscitated. And after three minutes to five minutes the baby was transferred to the neonatal unit and a baby actually died. But the parents had the positive aspects of actually having that baby for three minutes at their bedside whilst they were holding the baby's hand. The alternative would have been the baby was whisked away to the resuscitator and they would not have had that baby. They would have seen a sea of back. 
we did win an award, which was really good fun. So you can do intact cord resuscitation if possible, and bedside resuscitation is acceptable. And we need to bring that in. Anup Kathera in San Diego has been doing um, lots of research, and there is research out there for people to have a look. Talk about the cord blood donations, because parents are quite often coerced into um, signing up to donate their baby's cord blood or store their baby's cord blood without being given the, bene being given the benefits of delayed cord clamping. We can do both. We can do delayed cord clamping and store, and store trans, um, storage, but parents are signing up to this and going for the one-minute delay cord clamping without realising that they could be um, risking their baby having anemia. And certainly in countries where they haven't got guidelines for delay cord clamping, babies have immediate cord clamping with the hope for, of getting the biggest volume possible. There are also parents are signing up to in altruistically to give this blood to people who need it for their other children, but they're not realising and they're not being given the information about the, the disbenefits for their own baby. It's really important that as caregivers we give them both sides of the story so that they can make an informed choice on what's best for their baby. It's our blood, don't give it away. Hannah Tizard is a student or she's qualified midwife and she does resources all over the world. She has a website called www.bloodtobaby.com. You can get free resources which can be shipped out to any country by, by going to this website. She's also building on the website so there's lots of information about optimal core clamping. So if anybody wants to go there. Got a global network. Everybody in the world is working towards optimal core clamping and waiting for white because it's the benefits or the disbenefits of immediate core clamping, which is an inter it's an intervention that we haven't got the evidence, that we've no evidence to say that that is the right thing to do. We should be letting these babies have a gentle transition into the world, which gives them benefits for life. Any child that's anemic that has neurological development problems or learning problems, their mental health is affected for the rest of life, which is a public health problem as well. TED Talk by Alan Green. He's on he's a TED talk, it's ninety seconds to change the world. It's an eighteen minute um eighteen minute clip. Really, really good. There's lots of information on there. Did win an award because I I didn't particularly change the guidance for nice, but I nagged them so much that they did change. And it just shows that you can chip away, you can get there in the end. But there's lots more work to do. And there are my contact details. Um my contact deals. We did do a survey this year. We, we looked at 3,500, well, the, the, the Positive Birth Movement with Millie Hill did a survey for 3,500 women or parents, and it showed that 20% of babies in the UK are still getting immediate cord clamping, and 40% of parents report that the cord has been cut earlier than they want because people just do not understand the physiology or the evidence or the benefits behind immediate cord, delayed cord clamping. And, um, we need to do the the research that does the cord milking is ANUP A N U P Kathera K A T H E R I A. I will spell it. Yeah. That is the end of the presentation. Um, Thank you, Amanda. Any questions? Sorry, it's a whistle stop tour, but um, yeah, lots to say. Yes, but you did it fine and it wasn't too fast. <laughs> um, and it, it is fascinating to understand the background to all of this. Um, and uh, I certainly can relate to the fact that when I um, first practiced as a midwife, um, active birth or active management really was coming in and I was taught to cut and clamp the cord quite quickly and that if you didn't there would be jaundice and there certainly was a lot of jaundice physiological jaundice and to this day we still don't really know why that was perhaps nowadays babies are more healthy I don't know but anyway so this is uh, fascinating any comments think, from anybody oh sorry go on Amanda we saying about the jaundice we do give the oxytocin and there isn't evidence around this but if you think that you give the oxytocin and it clamps down the placenta the research says there isn't any jaundice but you will say that community midwives say there is more but if you give an oxytocin and the uterus clamps down you interfere in that fine transition between mum and baby and i do wonder you know we obviously need lots more research whether that does the, the interference may cause um but you know we have to be really good at picking up on the jaundice 
a little bit of increased jaundice is not it's not a good enough reason to be doing immediate core clamping or early core clamping. I totally so, agree. Yeah, Vicky is you. saying that um, she's getting women coming to her with these. This is an idea now. Vicky, where do you work, live? In New Zealand. Now, I thought New Zealand were usually leading the way. Um, so optimal core clamping is not um, normal practice in New Zealand. Well, Christchurch have fantastic guidelines. You've got um, Sarah, I've forgotten who it is. She's got some fantastic guidelines down in Christchurch. Um, so it might be worth might be worth getting in touch with um, Christchurch. I've forgotten the name, Sarah. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. They've got some fantastic guidelines. In fact, I would, um, if you get in touch with me, I can send the guidelines out or put you in touch. Better take um, a picture of this um, page, everybody, so you can contact Amanda. Yeah, I think it's the same with everything. It's the same in the UK. You've got pockets of people that are doing optimal core clamping and they're doing fantastic. And the hospital in the next town might be doing immediate core clamping. And I would say it's probably the same all over. Practice is really patchy. Sarah Pallet? Sarah Pallet, Sarah Pallet yeah, she's, um, she's actually on our page. She's one of the, um, I started the page and there was just me. And then um, it's such a good platform that we've got lots and lots of people on there now to use this platform to change practice throughout the world. And then um, Sarah Pallet's done great work in New Zealand. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Um, it is. Yeah, people don't understand. Um, and I don't know how we change it. And I also think midwives, you know, we have to impart so much information that it's squeezing another bit in. And in the survey that Millie Hill did, it shows that a lot of the information that parents are getting are coming from outside antenatal courses, NCT, positive birth movement, Catherine Gray's hypnobirthing, the Daisy Foundation. Um, lots of people are doing the information. That's in the UK. Um, but we just need to keep chipping away. And the more people that jump on, it's a really good band to be in, really, because there's no competition, which is unusual in the medical profession. But everybody wants the same, same um, outcome, really. So the more people that get on there, you can use my presentation um, for your own needs or just get in touch with me and um, join the snowball rolling. Ola Anderson said it's like rolling a snowball. It's getting bigger and bigger. And it doesn't matter who pushes it, whether it's a parent or a top researcher. Uh, but the more that we push, and the bigger it gets, and then hopefully immediate core clamping will become practice in the past. Yeah, Kerry, in North, Kerry in Northampton is saying that she's going to take it back to her fellow students. And I was about to type in and ask, is that mean that you're not actually taught this? <laughs> Hi, Paula. OK. Fair enough. I thought for a minute you weren't, but you're not taught white, uh, wait for white. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. I think it's very descriptive, isn't it? Did we have, did we have any other questions at the top that I missed? Um, da, 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 da. Yes, this whole thing about cord gases. Why do we need to worry about cord gases? This is like um, pathophysiologically um, labeling all babies at birth, isn't it? It's uh, medical legal. It's medical legal, but what they're actually doing is the babies come out and they're probably absolutely fine, and then we deprive the baby of 30% of the blood volume. We have a K2 training package in the UK that actually says cut the cord immediately to do this. But I have to say that I got in touch with them and they have changed their, um, they've changed it. They've changed their, their uh, K2 training. And they're going to look into advertising um, doing blood gases with the cord intact. It can be done. Nana Weiberg in Sweden um, have done studies, and Ulla Anderson have done studies where they looked at pHs, which were done with the cord intact. Uh, it can be done. Um, so why we have to go in? And it's awful to see a baby that's been born, and then you look at all the blood that's in the cord. And you know we expect the baby to be, we expect the placenta to resuscitate the baby with its inside. If there's a deceleration, we don't go in and clamp and cut the cord. But as soon as the baby's out, we think that we can interfere. And the placenta will, will resuscitate that baby. You know, it's just having the confidence to sort of stand back. I worked at a hospital last year where we did birth centre and we did no cord management. Baby was delivered skin to skin, no cord management. 
on the labor ward they did do a, um one minute which isn't long enough but you know you get the pediatricians coming into the room and they would stand back everybody would stand back for a minute and watch this baby and 99 times out of 100 there was no intervention they'd just walk away you know they'd just say right that's fine baby's fine and they'd just they walk away because the placenta does its job you know yeah You kind of think that the medico legal thing would apply in the light of the evidence if you did not allow it to to um, stop clamping because you you are actually intervening, aren't you? I agree completely, and that's again, it's the not understanding the physiology of birth and the placental transfer fusion. Judith Mercer does a fantastic paper that's called Rethinking Placental Transfusion. And I'd recommend everybody read it. It covers everything from stem cells to anemia to resuscitation to the transition. So I, I would recommend that everybody that if that's Judith Mercer, I'll write it down. Judith Mercer. Um, and it's rethinking central. Sorry, I'm not doing I'm not doing capital fusion. And it's online. You can get it quite easily with the uh, with Google. Okay, we've got time for one more question, so I'm going to really put you in the spot because Susanna has asked quite a humdinger of a question, oops, which has just disappeared from my screen anyway. Um, in your experience, what kind of advocacy has worked when presenting this information to physicians and pediatricians? Um, like I said, with Northumbria, they were really, really good because they actually do, you have to do it as a team approach. You have to get everybody on board. Midwives can find it quite difficult. I did find it quite difficult. Um, and if you don't succeed with consultants, find a consultant that will back you. Pediatricians, um, you can't say that one group's worse than another, really, but sometimes you'll get pediatricians. We did find at the hospital that I worked in 2012, I won an award for this and we were doing really, really well. And I came back to work and after two days they banned delayed cord clamping for 14 months because the paediatricians had said that it caused polycythemia. They had no evidence to support that, but that was absolutely devastating. So it's about doing a joint approach. I know Aberdeen in the UK are all working together because I did a talk up there and it was attended by, if you attend a conference like this or a conference, you get all the information, it's not rocket science. And if you've got people from different denominations in that conference, and they go back on math uh, with student midwives, with the consultants. You can change practice really quite quickly, like they did in Northumbria. So it's about, I don't know, um, get a copy of Judith Mercer's Rethinking Placental Transfusion and wave it under their nose. And it's about chipping away. And if you find that somebody doesn't, try and find somebody that's not. Because eventually, at the trust that I work, we did get it through. And it was a consultant that did it. It was um, a consultant who saw the benefits, who managed to change it. And some people are, you know, they're much more better placed to get practice in there. Um, but it's about chipping away. It is about chipping away. And parents are incredibly important because parents are the people that are asking for this now. They're coming in, they're demanding delay core clamping because they know the benefits. They shouldn't have to. We should be doing this. Um, and it's parents that are being the biggest change activists. As they often are. Yes, well, I have to say thank you very much, Amanda, for a fabulous um, presentation. I'm very pleased to have heard it at last. And obviously, um, it's getting out there. And it's nice to see that the midwives around the world are um, are involved in this. I've always felt that the whole childbirth thing was far too rushed. And probably we accidentally left the cord for quite a while in the past because you were never in a rush to get the whole thing completed. You were too busy admiring the baby and um, dealing with the husband and other children who came running in, all that kind of stuff. So there you go. Anyway, 